So in their theology and in their decisions and in their ministry, in their preaching and teaching, the New Testament church depends on guidance from the Old Testament scriptures. So where did they learn that? They learned that from Jesus. He quotes more from the book of Deuteronomy than any other book. And so it's really amazing if you look at it. And so today, if we cut ourselves off from that, we really do cut ourselves off, not just physically from two thirds of the Bible, but we cut ourselves off from the people, the history, the symbols and typology and the covenant that gave rise to the New Testament covenant. Welcome everyone. Today we are so very blessed to have Raymond Woodward back on the podcast. He is a superintendent of Canada District and is the teaching pastor of CCC in Fredericton, New Brunswick. In this episode, he talks to us about the importance of the Old Testament and why it is so necessary to study and teach from it. Well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us, Brother Woodward. It's my honor to be here, Pastor Greg. So thankful for you and, and grateful for this opportunity to talk. We're excited to have you back on. Uh, we were just with you uh, a couple months ago. Well, it's more than a couple months ago now, but uh, the year kind of gets away from you, especially does, uh, camp season for you guys over there in America. Yep. But uh, it, it was so good to see you earlier this year. I think it was in, I believe it was in May uh, when you were on the Gold Coast. Um, and uh, we, we were talking while we were there and you've been on here before and, and hopefully those who haven't heard that conversation, I'll encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. The first time we had brother Woodward on, because we went more into his story, talked about, um, you know, advice that he has, uh, for young leaders and leaders in general, uh, and, uh, study, uh, helps and all of that. It was really, really good. So I encourage you guys to go back and listen to that or watch it. It was one of my favorite conversations on, on the podcast. And so when I saw you at the Gold Coast, I was like, hey, would you mind coming back on uh, <laughs> and doing it again? <laughs> well, I really enjoyed that conversation as well. We, you know, talked a little bit about my story in ministry, but also uh, my passion. Uh, we talked about teaching and teaching mm. the word of God, of course, specifically. And I just uh, I just absolutely love talking about that. I get started and it's hard to get stopped sometimes. That podcast probably ran over. I'm not sure, but it probably <laughs> did, I'm guessing. Well, while we were there, we were talking uh, uh, because I think, I don't know if it was in between. No, I think it, we'd already started POCC when you came for Turning Point, which we recorded directly after that. But um, I was talking to you about like, you know, being a young pastor at a, a, a church that's, you know, at the very beginning stages. We're laying groundwork, foundation, and all of that. And I was talking about how, like, sometimes we can be almost too drawn to the New Testament. It's like, there's so much that these uh, people, you know, don't quite know yet, and you're wanting to flesh it out and expound on the epistles, expound on the Gospels, and all of that. Um, but, you know, if we focus too much on that, we miss out on uh, what the Old Testament has for us. And obviously, mm -hmm. the, the Old Testament... Uh, was there before it was the the Bible that that the apostles had, um, but we were talking briefly about that, and, and we thought this might be a, a good thing to discuss here on the podcast because you're someone who is uh, quite notorious in the way that you teach the Old Testament. Um, you, know, you teach both, obviously, and, and mm -hmm. you know you can go onto your your personal website, and there's like whole. Uh, outlines for entire books of the New Testament that you go through chapter by chapter. Uh, but uh, you you expound on the Old Testament in, in a beautiful way. And so I thought this would be a great conversation to have with you um, as an elder. Why do you feel it is important that we continue to teach and preach out of the Old Testament? Well, <clears throat> I think you just said it. Um, Jesus and the apostles showed us how to do this. Uh, that was the only scripture that they had. So, you know, when we talk about the New Testament church and we, you know, we love to speak about the stories in the book of Acts and the background of the epistles, everything that happened there. Um, but every time it talks about them preaching, teaching, they're doing it using the Old Testament. The New Testament does not exist yet. Um, 
when you start the book of Acts, you're roughly AD 30, early 30s for sure. Um, the Gospels, uh, three of them are not penned till the 60s. Uh, got John's books, all five of them are not penned till the 90s. So Paul's epistles are somewhere between the 50s and the mid 60s, so maybe a 15 year span. So all of the apostolic ministry in the New Testament, they're using the Old Testament. Jesus uses the Old Testament. And so I think we miss a huge opportunity there um, if we don't do what they did and in the way that they did it. And uh, so I think you already hit on kind of that's the, the core idea is that if it was so important to them, it needs to be very important to us as well. Along with what you're saying, I think it, it gives us a background of the individuals as well, you know, like where they come from, um, the cultural background that, that they came up in, and, and basically, uh, you know, why Jesus ministered in the way that he did, why the apostles ministered the way that they did. Um, you get a lot of that from the Old Testament. Absolutely. It, it is the background. Um, so many of the images, you know, the, the big one, of course, is the tabernacle out of the book of Exodus. Uh, it's rich in typology. It has shadows and symbols. So some people would say, well, you know, that was for them. It doesn't really have any meaning for us. But when you read the book of Hebrews, it's all tabernacle based and tabernacle allusions and tabernacle typology. When you read so many of Paul's writings and he talks about even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. How in the world do you know anything about that? If you don't know Exodus and even into Leviticus, the, the, the symbols, the ceremonies, the festivals, um, I, I, I have this here and, and I thought this would be a, a great thing to share. Um, until the books of the New Testament were written and distributed in the you know mid to late first century, the Old Testament scriptures are the only word of God that they have in the early church. So here's what we see. With the help of the Old Testament and the power of the Holy Ghost, they're still able to minister and win the lost in a very dynamic way. Here's what I want to share with you. Peter quoted Joel at Pentecost to explain the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In that same message, he quotes Psalms to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, in his defense before the Jewish council, this is Stephen's sermon. It's the longest sermon in the book of Acts. He opens with Genesis. He closes with Isaiah. And in the middle, he refers to Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Amos. Then you have Philip. He teaches the Ethiopian eunuch about baptism in Jesus' name using only the writings of Isaiah. And then James, he concludes the Jerusalem church council by quoting Amos. Paul does this all through his writings. Uh, he even uses like an Old Testament verse about oxen to teach the churches to support their spiritual leaders. Don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Um, so in their theology and in their decisions and in their ministry, in their preaching and teaching, the New Testament church depends on guidance from the Old Testament scriptures. So where did they learn that? They learned that from Jesus. He quotes more from the book of Deuteronomy than any other book. And so it's really amazing if you look at it. And so today, if we cut ourselves off from that, we really do cut ourselves off, not just physically from two thirds of the Bible, but we cut ourselves off from the people, the history, the symbols and typology and the covenant that gave rise to the New Testament covenant. And so we really don't get to understand fully the word of God if we lose all of the cultural background, all the historical background, all the theological background that the early church had access to. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, it, while we were talking about this uh, in, in, in the Gold Coast, you mm -hmm. mentioned that you know it's become a bit popular not to teach from the Old Testament, that there seems to be um, a bit of a rise amongst uh, larger church pastors or different theologians mm -hmm. who are saying, you know, maybe we don't need to teach so much out of the Old Testament. Is there any sort of validity to their position? <clears throat> I would say, uh, number one, I hope we never get there uh, yeah. because we're, we're trying to be an apostolic church, which means we're going to do it like 
the apostles did. You know, we're, we're, we're using a technology right now that the apostles didn't have. So we have to qualify that. We're not going to, we're going to do it with electricity and internet and air travel. They didn't have that. But what we're always talking about is doctrinally, experientially, uh, we are going to try our best to replicate a 21st century version of the first century apostolic church. So what I see here in North America, and there are some larger churches that are, are kind of doing this. Um, they're, they're basically making statements like this. You know, we're um, in the New Testament covenant. We're in the new covenant. Uh, for us, the scripture needs to start at Matthew 1 verse 1. And, uh, you know, we, we basically start there and they'll, they have to allude to the Old Testament somewhere. So they'll say, so, you know, the stories are good and they have good moral lessons, but we're New Testament covenant people. Never even thinking that the New Testament, uh, you know, some of the images we've already referred to in our conversation here, um, all of those things, uh, blood atonement, uh, Passover lamb, um, the whole concept of sanctification, being holy, being a separated people, all of those have their roots in the Old Testament. Um, so I, I don't see a lot of validity to their position. Uh, the only time I get nervous about people preaching from the Old Testament, Pastor Greg, is when somebody gets, you know, very heavily kind of into allegory and whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're, but you can do that with the New Testament too. Jesus yeah, told yeah. parables and, you know, like uh, the, the woman with the lost coin, she's sweeping her house with a broom. Uh, I don't even think the scripture says with a broom, but she's sweeping her house. <laughs> and and so that makes her a witch, obviously, because she has a broom. You know, <laughs> you can take anything and try to make some weird point out of it. So sometimes people get into the stories of the Old Testament and they pull a, a you know, a detail out that, you know, you can take a principle and you can even make an application. I'm good with that. Um, a funny one that, that actually is quite common is, is, uh, you know, David, uh, goes down to the brook. He's getting ready to go out to battle with Goliath. He chooses five smooth stones. Well, I've heard all kinds of sermons on that. I've heard that Goliath had four brothers. So he's thinking he's going to take them all out. I've heard that represents the fivefold ministry, uh, all kinds of stuff. For me, I draw a different application. In the Old Testament, the penalty for blasphemy, which Goliath has done every day for 40 days, the penalty for blaspheming is death by stoning. I think David just said, if nobody else is going to handle this guy, I'm going to handle this guy. So that's my application, but I don't know. So I need to be careful if I'm teaching from the Old Testament to make application and say it's application in some way. Don't act like I've got some special revelation from God that I know what, you know, all these little intricate, trivial details mean, because really we don't. Um, and I, that's the only time I get nervous, but I've heard guys do that in the New Testament, and that makes me just as nervous. So if there's any validity to this position of being careful with the Old Testament, uh, I'm going to agree with them on principle. But that's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing the Old Testament doesn't apply to us. The Old Testament is passe. Uh, we're New Testament. Start in Matthew and go in the New Testament and only refer to the Old Testament like we would refer to Shakespeare. It's beautiful and poetic and it's nice stories. Um, really, there's a couple of significant pastors in the U.S. that are making statements like this. Um, don't Anchor your faith on the fact that uh, Jonah and the whale was a true story. Don't anchor your faith on the fact that Noah and the ark was a true story. That's garbage theology. If, if any of those are not true, we throw out the word of God. It's, it's either all true because the Bible makes statements about itself like that. It's either true or it's not true. So I think we need to do due diligence. We need to look at cultural settings and symbolism and allegory because that's all in the word of God. There's poetical books there. There's prophetical books there. There's allegory and symbols and all of that. But to actually take some of the major stories that Jesus himself referred to as fact and say, mm, don't anchor your faith to that. 
That's garbage theology. And so that's the danger that I see here in North America. Um, and, and strangely enough, these people are coming out of some significant denominations and they're just kind of kissing their past goodbye and they're just setting their, their ship of their church adrift, in my opinion. And every time they do that, what I think is, what's the agenda? And every single time, Pastor Greg, it's um, we want to allow something, whether it's a lifestyle, whether it's a doctrine, whether we want to go low on commitment to attract a crowd. Every single time I've come across any pastor of any background throwing out the Old Testament, they're always trying to discount the way we serve God today. Something's afoot. There's always an agenda. And so my radar goes sky high anytime I hear about somebody saying, ah, the Old Testament, because as we've already discussed, the apostles and Jesus did not feel that way. So uh, I guess a, not a counterpoint, but uh, something I'd like to ask you mm -hmm. as, as someone who is you know, leading a, a, a newer church, um, sort of, I guess, from, from your perspective, how often should you be teaching from the New Testament compared to the Old Testament? Because so, one of the thing, one of the issues that I might have when it comes to teaching on the Old Testament, we need to do that, obviously. Our mm -hmm. congregations need to know it. We've already established that. But um, if we focus so much on that and, you know, Jesus is hardly talked about on Sunday because we got stuck in a story uh, that didn't make its way back to Christ, you know, or mm -hmm. um, we get stuck uh, in the Old Testament a lot and we don't talk so much about what was taught in the epistles and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what, I guess maybe not percentage-wise, but uh, as from your perspective, what should the balance look like when it comes to That's teaching the Old question. Testament and the New Testament? Well, Jesus said, uh, John five thirty nine. he said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. He's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees and he's saying, you know, you know all these scriptures, you've memorized them, you think you have eternal life. But he says, and they are they which testify of me. So the whole point of the Old Testament is to head uh, to, I, I can't remember if it was Spurgeon or Moody, one of the old classic preachers, he said, I take a text and I head for the cross. I take a mm. text and I head for the cross. And the principle is the same. So I don't think of it in terms of a percentage uh, as far as how much. There's never been a sermon that I've ever preached that I know of where I didn't use the New Testament or head toward the New Testament. I did a, oh my goodness, it was like the Great Tribulation, a 14-part series, I think, on 1 Samuel. Well, 1 Samuel is about, in fact, I was the, the I played a trick on myself. I'm thinking, man, I want to do 1 Samuel because I want to teach about David. 1 Samuel, I get into it, it's all about Saul. David makes an appearance as a kid, as a, a soldier in the army, uh, Saul's assistant, Saul's captain, but it's all about Saul. I was so ready to kill Saul. I wanted to do it myself <laughs> by the end of that series. But every time that we would teach, I'm teaching through the details. It was a very detailed series. We didn't go verse by verse, but we sure went paragraph by paragraph through the book of first Samuel. It's 31 chapters or something. So, so it was a midweek series. It's not what I'm preaching to first time guests and visitors. It's Bible study. But even in Bible study, you're going to the New Testament every time. I've my, my goal long term personally, this is just personal, is uh, with our YouTube channel. I want to eventually have a series on every book of the New Testament and um, every major section of the Old Testament. But I have done book series. I've done uh, like Song of Solomon. It's all symbolism. But what's it symbolic of? The bride of Christ, uh, the wedding of the ages. Um, I've done Ecclesiastes. What's it about? The futility of life. You need to look beyond this life. I've done Proverbs. What's that about? Jesus, God is the source of wisdom. So every time I teach from the Old Testament, it's going to head toward the New Testament. Now, that being said, to circle back 
to your very good question, I, I think you should really kind of look at it as, you know, the Old Testament is two thirds of the Bible. The New Testament is one third, but we are New Testament people. So I think you should be in the New Testament, in the texts, in the epistles, in the gospels. I think you should be in there at least half the time, if not more. Um, and, and again, there are exceptions. If you're doing a series on the book of Proverbs, you're not going to be taking your text from there, but I could show you any set of notes I've ever done. And there's New Testament and Old Testament blended together, no matter where I start. Um, and, and so I think that's a really good question and a really important point. Um, you know, you could even fairly say, uh, flip it. The Old Testament is two thirds of the, the uh, Bible, but a lot of that's the prophetic books. I'm lost most of the time in the prophetic books. So, so I'm going to take principles and paragraphs and stories. I don't care. Yeah, I'm going to be careful here. But really, <laughs> let's just say it like I was going to say it. I don't care what happened to Edom and Nineveh. Uh, that's <laughs> hundreds of years ago. Who cares? I care about the principles. I care about uh, the parallel that Jonah goes to preach uh, to Nineveh. And the parallel to Jesus' ministry. Why does Jesus quote uh, Jonah? Because three days in the belly of the great fish, three days in the heart of the earth, that's where I'm heading. I don't care what happened in Nineveh. It's, it's a historical fact. So, you know, I, I think you could even flip it. The Old Testament's two thirds of the Bible, but we're New Testament people. So let's say even two thirds in the New Testament. And one third in the old. For me, I'm probably about half and half. If I think back to the last um, four messages that I've done at CCC, there's two in the old and two in the new. Um, and uh, it's just about half and half for me. But that doesn't mean that I'm in the Old Testament for the whole message. It's always coming to the new. Yeah, that's such a good point that you no know, matter what you're teaching, and this is something that I learned at Bible school, is no matter what you're teaching, no matter where you're coming from, you want to somehow get to Jesus at some point. You know, Absolutely. You're a Christian. And <laughs> exactly. And he's well, our and salvation he's the point. And so exactly. I mean, he said that. Search the scriptures, they testify of me. If you can't find Jesus in that story, don't preach it. Mm. It's That's plain and simple. Yeah. Uh, one of the points you made, talking about how... Uh, you know, some I, I think it's kind of embarrassment. You know, these people are uh, learned, or they they get in circles and they're having conversations with people, and they're having to justify, you know, the story of Jonah. They're having to justify Noah, and so they're embarrassed. And it's like, well, I want to be a Christian. I know it's true. I know I know God's real. I know uh, Jesus came to save, uh, but I don't want to have to have these conversations. You know what I mean? And always, you, that's what it and is. And that, and as you said. You, you can't take one without the other, right? No. Jesus referred to these people as if they were exactly. real. So did Paul. Uh, and we can't yeah. just pretend like they didn't exist. No. I, I think the original motive for some of these people, I'm going to really give them the benefit of the doubt here. I think the original motive was good. They've got kids in their churches going off to colleges. They're getting lambasted on every side and and, and, and attacked and their, their theology and the Bible's being attacked. Um, but to me, it's exactly the wrong approach to now say, okay, we're going to make the church more like your university. We're not going to talk about those stories. Uh, we're going to say they could be myth. They could be fables. They could be just allegory. Uh, what a, what a faulty premise that every time the world pushes in on us, we're going to back up and, and let them push further. Uh, no, we stand on the word of God mm -hmm. and that's all of the word of God. Um, Jesus said, um, not one jot or tittle will pass away. The smallest punctuation marks in the Hebrew language, not one of those little tiny punctuation marks will pass away until all things be fulfilled. Um, and he's talking about the law. Uh, how much more all the prophetic books and the prophecies and and the the we call them the poetical books, uh, but when you talk about the Book of Psalms, the largest book in the Bible, of course, um, that is a worship book. I don't want to have a relationship with God 
without the book of Psalms. It's basically, you know, every emotion known to man. Sometimes David is weeping. Sometimes he's rejoicing. Sometimes he's angry. Oh, God, break out their teeth. And it's amazing because I've probably prayed all of those. I don't know <laughs> that I've ever prayed the break out their teeth prayer, but it's it's come close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it. Yeah, it's so important because if you tear down that foundation, how long is it before you're you're looking at the resurrection, which is even an even bigger miracle than some of these other things that we're discussing. You know, if if you're willing to get rid of that, at what point do you say, okay, well, he was a great teacher and he changed the world. That's enough for me. It's like, yeah, Yeah. but did he rise? And Paul says, you know, if he didn't rise, all this is in vain. Absolutely. And uh, so, so it's, it's this progression that we see and I just don't ever want to go anywhere near uh, the top of that slippery slope because that's exactly what it is. Um, if if we throw out any part of the word of God, if we, you know, and they won't say it that way. We're not throwing it out. We're just de-emphasizing. We're just not going to talk about it. We're not going to preach from it. That's the same thing. Um, you, you've taken parts of God's inspired word, um, which is God breathed, according to the Apostle Paul. That's the term he uses. Um, so you well, take and, that and you throw it uh, out. Not, not to cut in too much for the Woodward, but no. when he's talking about that, he's not necessarily talking about the Gospels or the Epistles. He's talking about the Old Testament. The Gospels and the Epistles don't exist at that point. Yeah. Not in written form. Uh, yeah. Maybe some of the Epistles have been written, and but you're exactly right. Um and when Jesus says, not one jot or tittle will pass away, what law is he talking about? It's not New Testament, it's Old Testament. So, mm. no, you're exactly right. That's wonderful. And on top of that, he said, you know, I didn't come to get rid of it, but I came to fill it full of meaning, you know, exactly. to take it take it yes. further than where it's at right now. Uh, which, which to me is what we're trying to do with our preaching. And so it's it's not a moot point, but... It's a minor point when we think about uh, if if our ministry focus is right and if our desire is to get people to the new birth experience, uh, experienced by the apostles and the early church, to get to the doctrines and the understanding of theology that they had. If that's our goal, that's going to bleed through in our preaching no matter where we start, no matter what text we take. So... I I would say it's not a moot point, but it's a little bit of a minor point to me. I don't even really consider it uh, how much, you know, and I'm not trying to uh, shoot down your question because your question is a good question, but I don't really even think about now, how much am I preaching from the Old Testament this year? How much for the New Testament? The only time I would think about that is when I do like a long series, like that first Samuel one like the the three poetical books that I taught through. And I still want to do the book of Job. I've just never taught through the book of Job. I want to do it, but I want to do it in a way that people don't like head for the overpasses and the bridges to jump off after I teach. Um, so I've got to kind of wrestle through the book of Job myself. But I taught uh, Song of Solomon one year. I think it was the beginning of a year. I did Proverbs one year and I did Ecclesiastes one year. So even doing that, I didn't overdose on those. Um, So I think somewhere psychologically, subconsciously, I'm always thinking, got to get the gospel in here. Got to get, you know, New Testament principles uh, principles in here. But that's the whole point of our conversation today is um, the principles are the same in so many ways. The principle of a separated people unto the Lord, the principle of prayer and worship, the principle of the oneness of God. That's strong Old Testament, strong New Testament. Um, the new birth, we see it in the tabernacle. We see it in the uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of a seed. We see it in physical birth. We see it uh, all through the Old Testament. And then we come to the New Testament. So so really, if if my balance is right, I think my preaching balance will be right. But sometimes in this generation, and uh, you're younger than I am, your peers are younger than mine. Sometimes in this generation, I do think it's good to ask a question 
like you asked, what kind of percentages? Because I think with all the pressures we see in some of these other churches, if we're not careful, that can infect us. And we can say, well, maybe I should only be preaching from the New Testament. And maybe I should only reference the Old Testament as a storybook and whatever. Um, I, I think that's faulty understanding. So I think the question uh, that you brought up is is well placed. Um, year, years ago, there was an old Bible teacher, a lady in California. Uh, I've got some of her books, Henrietta Mears. And, and she said this, this is not original uh, with me. Um, I think this is so cool. She said, the new, talking about New Testament, Old Testament, the new is in the old contained. The old is in the new explained. The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. The new is in the old portrayed. The old is in the new displayed. So they work together. You take either side of that out and you don't have, the New Testament is not as effective without the underpinnings of the Old Testament because you lose many of Jesus' allusions, so much of his teaching and the same for all of the apostles. And people uh, people have tried it. Um, you know, uh, your birthplace is America, Thomas Jefferson uh, he was a child of the Enlightenment, so they actually call this the Jefferson Bible. It exists in the archives. He went to work on the Bible with a razor and glue and clipped out all the miracles because he didn't believe it. Um, he took six copies of the New Testament, and he starts you know, going with a razor blade. And by the time he got done, there was very little left because you subtract the miracles, you lose so much of the Gospels. Well, it's the same principle here. You subtract the Old Testament and you subtract all the allusions back to the tabernacle and the allusions back to Jonah and the allusions back to Noah and the allusions back to Joseph. And what do you have left? You've hollowed out the New Testament in a misguided attempt to emphasize the New Testament. So so it's it's really not a it, it's not a logical argument that they're making to me. Mm. Well, you've already pointed out a number of reasons why we should study and teach the Old Testament. Did you want to uh, put a final point on a few more uh, before we wrap up this conversation? Give some ministers who may be listening or Bible teachers uh, or Sunday school teachers, give them uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a fire to teach the Old Testament, to preach the Old Testament, and not just spend all of their time, as we've been talking about in okay. the Gospels and Epistles. Gotcha. Well, if you look at, um, you know, for example, the first five books of the Bible, let's, let's do that. Um, I, I, Genesis is obviously the book of beginnings. So, you know, most of the major doctrines of the whole Bible are introduced in seed form in the book of Genesis. Anytime you teach in the book of Genesis, you're going to come up with, you know, the creation, the fall, the entrance of sin, but also God's promise of redemption. I will put enmity between your, you and the woman and uh, your seed and, and, and uh, the, you and the, the, the woman, he's talking to the serpent between your seed, her seed. So you've got redemption uh, in the very first three chapters of the Bible. So anytime you look at, at Genesis, Joseph's story takes up a lot of real estate in Genesis. Um, uh, there's so many things in there. Um, one of my favorites is, um, Pharaoh, uh, we know he's betrayed by his brethren. He's sold for silver. He's such a beautiful type of Jesus. But then Pharaoh uh, exalts him to the throne and gives him a name, a new name, Zapanath Panea. The early church father, Jerome, said that means savior of the world. So literally, this perfect picture, uh, the first time we see Joseph, he's betrayed, he's sold, he's going down. The next time we see him, He's exalted to a throne. Uh, if you want to buy grain, every knee has to bow before him. He's given a name that means savior of the world. You can teach this beautiful picture of Jesus from the book of Genesis. Plus, you get all the seed thoughts for every major doctrine in the word of God. Then you go to the book of Exodus. That's where the Passover comes from. 
that's where we have a beautiful picture of blood atonement. That's where we end up with the tabernacle. I did a whole series on the tabernacle. The tabernacle is, you know, people talk about praying through the tabernacle. So the tabernacle is a beautiful picture of prayer. It's a wonderful picture of salvation. It's also a wonderful picture of uh, you and me, uh, that we are three parts. The tabernacle was three parts, the outer court, the tabernacle, the, the, the holy place, the holy of holies. Well, we're body, soul, and spirit. The tabernacle is this wonderful picture of you and me. The tabernacle is a beautiful, breathtaking picture of Jesus. Um, what a, what a, a loss if we don't sometimes look back to the beautiful symbolism and typology of the tabernacle. Uh, uh, Leviticus, you've got the law. Now that's a tedious book. I get it. But you've got so many beautiful things. So what I really try to do in those books is I read through, I read what others have said, and then I try to pull, and I think this is important to your question. I try to pull principles. Uh, I try to, to kind of amalgamate what's going on here with the law of the leper, really. Uh, well, leprosy is a type of sin. Leprosy, you lose feeling, you lose sensitivity. That's what sin does to you. But there's all kinds of other things like um, I've taught about it. Um, you know, there were no lepers healed in Israel in the Old Testament. You have Naaman the Syrian, but you have no Israelite lepers healed in the Old Testament. And then you open up the Gospels and all of a sudden lepers are coming and they, they have to blow the dust off the law of the leper from the book of Leviticus because nobody's ever used it before. And that's what a symbol of the Messiah. So in every book, you can, you can do this. Uh, numbers, the wilderness wanderings. Uh, what a beautiful picture that even when we mess up, God was faithful to them all the way through the wilderness, even when they rebelled. Uh, you get in the wilderness um, and you've got uh, the brazen serpent, powerful type of the cross. Then you get to Deuteronomy. That's the second law. Jesus talks about that book more than any other book. Uh, Moses reviews the law, but he talks about the promised land and he talks about his successor, Joshua. Again, you've got, um, you know, Jesus is our Moses. Jesus is our Joshua. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that law. Jesus is the way we get into the promised land, which for us is not an earthly country. It's a heavenly country. And so, you know, that's the first five books of the Bible. You can teach almost any subject, including things like our disciplines, separation of life, all of those principles. And that's just the first five books. We haven't got into David. He's major real estate in the Old Testament. Uh, we haven't got into any of the prophets. We haven't got into the beautiful, powerful, worshipful book of Psalms. My contention is you need the Old Testament because it's, it's beautiful and powerful in the way it unfolds this tapestry. And I would say one more thing from a preaching or teaching perspective I very seldom, this is just a personal preference, I'm a teacher, um, I very seldom start with a text of scripture in my preaching or teaching because I want to set the stage for that. So I'll tell a story. I'll, I'll tell the story that's going on in the scripture and I'll set it all up and I'll make it as interesting and, and, and I'll try to pull their attention in. I want them to feel like, my goodness, that could have happened yesterday but it didn't. It happened two or 3,000 years ago. And, and I want to tell it. And then I hook them with a verse, my text, and then I go on. By the time I get to the end of a message, Pastor Greg, there's going to be tons of scripture because I love just nailing things down with scripture. But I don't usually start with scripture um, because I want to intrigue them so that by the time the scripture hits their heart, the soil's ready to receive it. And it's like, oh, wow, yeah, that applies to me. So that's kind of a departure until we get here. I think the Old Testament does that for us as far as God's word. It seeds the clouds for a rain. It, it seeds the ground for a harvest. The Old Testament, those stories 
what happened to David and Moses and Joseph and all of those, uh, Isaiah, all of the prophets and the priests and the kings and the people, that seeds the ground. It opens our heart because they were people just like us. I, I read one statement and I've, I've said it myself too. If you took one word and you wrote it over the Old Testament, it would probably have to be a word like failure. No matter what they did, no matter how many sacrifices, no matter how much blood was shed in the tabernacle, it was a failure. You know, you, you get to the last verse of the book of Malachi and, and God saying, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. They're still in problems. So you can look at that and say, well, we can throw that out. It was a failure. I've failed too many times in my personal life. The Old Testament encourages me that even though Israel messed up over and over again, God still showed mercy and he still showed them um, love and, and forgiveness. And uh, grace is not just a New Testament concept. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So uh, again, I think that's what the Old Testament is for. It prepares us. My friend, uh, Morel Cornwell, probably the greatest home Bible study teacher on the planet. He's taught thousands, literally thousands of them. And he actually said to me, he said, I won't start people in the New Testament. They're not ready. He said, I, I need to take them through the Old Testament and prepare their hearts. And, um, and I, I really feel like that's the purpose of the Old Testament. At, it's the macro story. You know, me preaching a sermon and working my way to a text is the microcosm. But God's big plan is, here's the Old Testament. Here's the stories. Here's the prophets. Here's what I've already done. And here's what it was pointing to. And we head for the cross. Yeah, I, I think uh, in listening to all of that, which, which was amazing, I think sometimes some of these people who don't have much understanding of the Old Testament, because if you grew up in the Apostolic Church, or if you've been in the in, in an apostolic church for any number of time, yes. you're very well versed in the Old Testament. We spend yes, time there, right? And I think some of these um, other, and I don't want to go into critiquing specific ones, but other denominations, if they don't spend much time in it, then there isn't that foundation there, you know, and no. and there isn't that uh, appreciation. And sometimes that could be, you know, where you fall into um, believing that God is a Trinity, where you fall into not understanding the necessity of the new birth, because yeah. it's like, I can point to reasons in the old Testament, why the new birth is necessary. It's not something we're reading into the text. It's something that is plainly there, but exactly. it's because of the study and the effort put into understanding the old Testament and applying that to the new, yes. you can see, well, this is why you need to be born again of the water Absolutely. and of the spirit, you know? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think that it's, it's kind of like launching out in a boat on a, a wide open stormy sea and you don't take an anchor. Uh, the Old Testament is an anchor. Um, if Jesus used it as an anchor for his stories and his teaching, if the apostles used it for an anchor for their stories and their teaching, even the book of Revelation, when we wind up the New Testament canon of scripture with John's great vision, my goodness, there are so many allusions back to the Old Testament. Um, I've never taught the book of Revelation without alluding to Daniel, for example, because there's so many pieces of the book of Revelation that just, they lose their relevance unless you understand that, yes, John's getting a word from God, a vision from God's throne, but it's anchored in something. It's not just, you know, kind of random adrift. It's anchored to what God spoke to Daniel. It's anchored to some of the things God spoke to Zechariah and Isaiah. And, and so it's one whole. It's not a bunch of random parts. And we're going to choose the parts that kind of, you know, after Jesus arrived. No, it's, it's one whole. It's the word of God and the old points to the new and the new points back to the old. They point at each other. You take one out, you've got the New Testament pointing at nothing, or you've got mm. the Old Testament pointing at nothing. They point to each other. Wow, that's so good. Well, this this has been a great conversation, and I know with your uh, wealth of knowledge, we could have spent a lot more time on this subject, but I hope this has really just been an encouragement to those who 
uh, you know, maybe struggling or uh, maybe in conversations where it's like, well, I don't really have an answer why why we approach it from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, hopefully this is a help. And hopefully this al- also inspires me. I know it's inspired me to spend a bit more time uh, in the Old Testament when it comes to teaching it even to new saints because as it's been reiterated throughout the throughout the conversation that, yeah, they might be new, but what will prepare them for uh, the teaching of the New Testament are those stories, Are is that foundation that is found in the Old Testament. And I just want to thank you so much for your time today, Brother Woodward, and, and, and for your, your decades of study that, that has culminated into being able to have a conversation like this. Uh, was there any final thoughts? I'd like to give the guests the, the final word when it comes to uh, the end of each episode. Is, is there any final thoughts that, that you would like to leave with the audience here today? And again, thanks for your time. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you about this because I, I really think it's important. And for anybody that's listening or, or watching uh, today, I, I would say, you know, apply yourself to the word of God. Um, don't shy away from the difficult parts. There's, there's beauty there. Um, I, uh, you know, you mentioned new, new people, Pastor Greg, and I had a conversation this week uh, as we're recording this, it would have been last night for me at our midweek Bible study, a brand new couple. Um, they came up and kind of, uh, introduced themselves. I've met them at church, but I'm on the road a lot. And they came up and they were just enthralled with the lesson last night because uh, they're just hungry for the word of God. The lesson last night was they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. It was totally from the book of Psalms. We got to the New Testament, but they wanted to understand the word of God. They don't, sometimes we fight with straw men. We're feeling the pressure of these mega churches or these denominal pastors that are saying, we think this would be a wiser approach. That's not what a new convert feels. A new convert, just they're hungry to know the word of God. They're not there for the most part. Every once in a while, you get somebody that's been polluted by other background. They're there to know and learn and love the word of God. And we lead them best when we know and love and learn every part of the word of God. One of the things I'm personally doing this year, um, I do Bible reading programs, you know, but I'm such a type A perfectionist that I take great satisfaction in checking off that little box every day. I got my reading done and every once in a while, I just have to stop and slow down. And so my little personal project this year is walking through the book of Psalms, one Psalm at a time with a wide margin Bible and just writing down the things that I'm studying. And I have learned so much by slowing down and interacting with the word of God. And in this case, specifically the Old Testament. So if Paul talked about the whole counsel of the word of God, and if Jesus taught from the Old Testament and If they didn't make a distinction between the big sections of the word of God, let's not either. Let's study the whole counsel of the word of God. And I encourage everybody listening and watching today that you would just uh, fall in love with it all over again yourself. And let me close with this scripture. It's the writer of Psalm 119, not only the longest chapter in the Bible, but it's the chapter in which almost every verse is the word of God talking about the word of God. And whoever that author was, we don't know, but whoever he was, he uses all kinds of different words for the law. He talks about law and commandments and judgments and testimonies. He talks about precepts and statutes. He talks about all of that. And you would think that Psalm 119 would be a very heavy tedious book because he's constantly talking about your law and your statutes and all of that. But here's the verse that I want to close with today in our conversation. This is Psalm 119 and verse 54. He says, thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. It's like a local orchestra taking like the traffic handbook 
for the city of Sydney and putting it to music. You'd think like, that's boring. Well, that's what he's talking about. I'm taking the laws and the precepts and the statutes of God. And when I study them, they're so beautiful. They've become my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. That to me is the word of God. So um, I would love to pray for everybody today, if that's okay. And uh, I commend everybody here for being interested in a subject like this. And and I really encourage you to get into uh, the old and the new and let them point at each other and the beauty and the, the wonder of God's word just explodes in your spirit. So let's say a word of prayer. What a privilege to be here today. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every listener, every person that will watch this. I thank you for Pastor Greg and his heart to do this and to teach people your word. And I thank you for every teacher, every home Bible study teacher, every pastor that may listen to this congregation, to this conversation and and everybody that's in any congregation, anybody that's a, a saint in a local church, God help us to fall in love with your word. We do that best when we just open it up and we let your spirit talk to us through the pages of your word. God, let the stories come alive. Let the symbols and the allegories and the types come alive in our spirit. God, we dedicate and we devote ourselves to loving your word, obeying your word, submitting to your word, and for many of us, preaching and teaching your word. Let it be done to give glory to your name and to always point everyone to your great plan of salvation and to your cross, which is the centerpiece of the word and of all of human existence. We thank you for the privilege. We thank you for your word and we give you praise, Jesus. We ask it in your name. Amen.